All right. Um, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Collection Reflections. Uh, Collection Reflections is a series here at the State Library looking at particular uh, moments of research and stories and highlights from the State Library Victoria's collections. And uh, tonight is uh, a cauldron of Australian musical gems. And our guest this evening uh, is uh, Andrian Pertou, who okay. was born in Santiago, Chile. Um, so you probably may well be able to deduce. And uh, uh, is a freelance composer and uh, uh, an honorary fellow and composition teacher at Melbourne University. Uh, he's the president of the uh, Melbourne Composers League, uh, is a multi award winning composer, and his com compositions have been performed in over 32 countries, which I found quite amazing. So thank you for coming along tonight. Thank you for Andrea. inviting me. Um, but tonight we're specifically mm -hmm. talking about uh, Andrian's fellowship and his research that he did uh, into um, lost uh, Australian musical gems um, from our collection. And I guess probably uh, something that I didn't know that we had much depth in and something we've previously spoken about um, is how you actually went about the, the process of trying to find what to focus on for your fellowship. So mm. tell us a little bit about that, Andrea. Well, initially, um the idea was to explore the collection here at the State Library of Victoria, of course. And, um, you know, there's the, I was aware that I think the number was something around 200 composers, Australian composers, were re repre are represented in this collection. Um, now, when one begins to think about uh, Australian composition, I guess uh, uh, you generally have to start at about 18, around the 1850s to mm -hmm. Well, historically, as a country, uh, in, you know, uh, when you think of Australia as a country, you know, one can start looking at composition around the 1850s. Uh, the only composer that I was aware of at the time was uh, Charles Edward Horsley, and this was through his uh, Concerto for Violin and Orchestra. And actually, it was, uh, uh, was published very recently in 2007 by Lyobert Press. It was an ed edition prepared by um, Richard Duval which was actually researched through a fellowship of his own here as a, um, or as a um, honorary fellow mm. fellowship here in 2003. Um, now, the reason why I was aware of this uh, uh, composition is actually, which was, uh, sorry, Charles Edward Horsey, by the way, was born in London. So he's still looking at English-born composers. Yeah. And he migrated to Australia in 1961. Uh, and this piece was composed in 1949, so it's still pre-Australian. Uh, in the sense of co you know composition as, as a timeline. Um, now, anyway, I became aware of this piece actually through my work with Liber Press. I was actually the music engraver on this edition. Um, anyway, but apart from that, my knowledge of early Australian composition was quite limited. So mm. it really, uh, um, well, it really meant that I had to do quite a bit of research. And so but that's initially where the idea came from. With, uh, with, the, with the lost part, mm. with the lost musical gems, does that mean you were focusing on particular composers that were yeah. no longer alive? Or? Well, I guess the idea of lost gems, I mean, that's what one hopes to find. Mm. But that, that, I guess, uh, that relates more really to, yeah, essentially to what, what one hopes to find in the sense that they may not necessarily be gems or lost gems. Mm. But that was initially the idea, was not just to find the obvious, uh, um, well, you know, the obvious compositions that, that have had public acclaim or, or, or have been performed widely, but also to, to, to research widely, to, you know, just to get a sense of what, uh, um, I get, um, well, I guess get a sense of what uh, uh, is out there and at the same time hopefully discover some new, new yeah. works that haven't had much exposure. Yeah, so what sort of composers did you end up looking well, at? Well, I should talk about how this started. Actually, look, when you, when you look at the Australian Music Centre site, and this is where the whole process started, uh, um, in 19, uh, uh, sorry, in 2008, I think the list was 454 represented composers. That's where it all started. Um, now, that's a lot of composers to, yeah. you know, and, and to narrow it down to 24. Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, I thought, okay, how can I narrow that down further? I looked at associate, uh, well, they had a system of associate representation and fully represented composers. By the way, the Music Centre, the Australian Music Centre is a centre of information based in Sydney, uh, which represents uh, all, you know, all Australian, I guess, active Australian living and non-living composers. Um, now, 
uh, 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 represented composers was over 200. Mm. So then I came back to my list here at the, uh, uh, at the State Library uh, and, I, and I began to, um, I guess, to, to, to see what was available in that list. Mm. So sure. when you say you've got, you, mm. you had about 200 that you ended up looking at mm. and you had to cull it down to 24. I yeah. mean, that's, that's a yeah. pretty big poll. Yeah, and how I, did you face? How did you get through that? Um, I thought of ways to deal with that, and I guess one of the initial, uh, uh, well, one of the initial things that I decided to do was to think, I, to think about considering only the non-living composers, mm. which straight away I think w with the list here at the State Library brought it down to forty-four. Right. So that that was a good yes, a good limit. And um, then I, I guess using Keith Humble as as a guide because he was born in nine twenty-seven, he's no longer with us. I thought, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stop at the period of, you know, in other words, not born later than 1927 right. and no longer living with us. Yeah. Um, and and that, that really brought it down to, tw to 44. Mm. And then from that, I really used an intuitive, I guess uh, you would call it a, a subjective process to really narrow it down to 24. I had a look at, um, I tried to assess what I thought, you know, who I thought was interesting and, um, and really narrowed it down what, that way to to the 24 that I... Um, now, the 24 includes people like Roy Agnew, John Anthill, Don Banks, Arthur Benjamin, Clive Douglas, P uh, Peggy Glanville Hicks, Eugene Goosens, P Percy Granger, Raymond Hansen, Fritz Hart, Marjorie Hesse, Alfred Hill, Mary Hill, Dulcie Holland, Robert Hughes, Keith Humble, French Hutchins, Mirren Hyde, Horace Keats, Louis Laverton, Doreen Legallion, William Lovelock, James Penberthy, and Margaret Sutherland. What I did find uh, at the library, actually, uh, as part of my research, I guess I did find, especially recordings, people like Clive Douglas, Raymond Hansen, Fritz Hart, Marjorie Hesse, Louis Laverton, James Penberthy, very limited recordings. Mm. Um, so in many cases, it became a case of actually having to... I, I had a, a, an office at, in the do, next to the Dome reading room. Mm. It was actually a matter... I mean, the process was really working on, on, online, really, and, mm. and doing searches and, and requesting materials, and then I'd be making trips all around the library, collecting things, um, uh, taking my laptop around to listen to things. Um, I guess a whole lot of different, a variety of different methods um, and from time to time I actually had to photocopy maybe a few pages or either take my keyboard down to the heritage uh, uh, reading room mm. and, and play through some scores mm. and get a sense of what, what I was interested in. Um, but from then on to actually, when we, when we talk about the actual pieces themselves, how I, I you know, what, how that selection was made was very much intuitive in the sense that it really was subjective in, and it was to do with uh, um, what I thought was, was interesting. Yeah. Um, well, and also the mm. sorts of styles and, and influences of That's right. from your own mm. background and experiences. Yeah. Yeah. So um, how, do you, how do you then transpose those sorts of scores between um, you know, taking these, these what are considered to be finished pieces um, of, of, work, of music and then reinterpreting them, or, or taking the essence, an essence of them, and, mm. and turning it into something that becomes both, you know, it, it acknowledges mm. that classic piece, but also becomes something that is mm. written by you. I had a few uh, little experience, I guess, you know, some experience, I should say, of of, of uh, incorporating quotations in my work previously, um, but in this case, I had a concept. So I guess, it, and the concept was to write twenty-four pieces and pieces inspired by in mm. some way and, and this is the, the point you're referring to and I guess you know utilizing materials in various ways you know quotation theme and variations canonic manipulation reharmonization uh, reharmonization is something that happens in jazz a lot where you hear a tune and it's harmonized in a totally different way and you, it's almost unrecognizable because mm. of the underlining harmony um, now I, I had a few different concepts, so really uh, uh, the way that I would manipulate these materials had to do, I guess, uh, I'll explain a few, different, a few different ideas that I incorporated. You know, one was to do with the rhythm, uh, you know, the way that I would reinterpret these ideas. Um, now this related to uh, an American composer called Henry Cowell, who wrote a really influential book in the 1930s, in 1930 actually, 
new musical resources. And, and what this book uh, presented, one of the theories that it presented was, uh, it was a very influential book for many composers in the 20th century. And one of uh, uh, the theories that it presents in this book is really the, the, the idea of composing, associating pitch or frequency ratios with tempo or rhythmic ratios in a polyrhythmic sense. Now, um, for those of non-musicians out there, a pitch ratio, if I was to explain a pitch ratio, um, let's say, um, let's take a piece of string, and this could be on a, on a piano, on a harp, or, or a monochord. If you took a piece of string and you halved it, and let's say you call that the fundamental, the, the, this would be the 1-1 one, one ratio. If you halved it, the pitch, the note that that would produce is twice as high as the initial, you know. Mm -hmm. So 2 to 1 ratio will produce twice as high. Mm. When musical terms an octave high, if you think of the 12 notes of the piano, mm -hmm. um, now, the, which are repeated octave by octave. Um, now, when you think, so, okay, so then if you think of the, that piece of string, if you went two thirds um, of, of that uh, uh, length, you'd get a 3 2 ratio, which is the G note, the, the dominant note, which is the most you know, important note in. in in Western music. Now the point here I'm trying to make is if you then consider rhythmic ratios and you convert that to rhythm, you could say, okay, what can I, three, two becomes, if you think of that, that was the pitch. Now if you convert that to rhythm, you can think three in the time of two, which is a simple hemiola. Three in the time of two, I'll have to demonstrate here, is if you think of, um, if you think of, that's the pulse, Three in the time of two is... Mm. So the right hand is playing three times in the time of two. The inversion of that is two in the time of three, so... Mm. Okay, now these ideas were um, developed by Henry Cowell in, this, uh, in, in the sense that you, you would take the chromatic scale and and apply a rhythmic ratio to each of these notes. Now, that was, so that was one idea. The rhythms would be applied, all these rhythms that you could associate with 12 notes would apply, be applied to the pieces. Um, the second thing uh, is harmony, and this, uh, the harmony in the pieces related to um, uh, Elliot Carter. Elliot Carter, by the way, is an American composer who was born in 1908. And he's still alive and will be 203 in December this year. Wow. Which is quite amazing and I've been part of concerts through the years, even a year ago where, uh, where I've, I've, you know, I've become aware that there's a piece, there's a new piece by Elliot Carter that is mm. being premiered. So it's quite amazing. He, he created this, uh, um, well he produced this book which is called the Harmony Book and um, anyway he just to tell you in simple terms what he does with these 12 notes, it really comes from the idea of mathematics of combinatorics or the idea of finding every possible combination of 12 items, you could say. So what he does, he creates a whole series of, you know, in other words, you know, you can, if you combine three notes, there are 12 possible unique combinations of three notes. This is in music, when it comes to musical harmony, there are 29 possible ways of combining four notes, there are 38 ways of combining five notes and 50 notes of combining six. I've taken those 50, um, did I say 50, six note chords and two of those will be in every, in every, I, I will explore that harmonic world or I should say that sound world in each of those 24 and of course there's two left and 12 and 24 will have an extra. Uh, so anyway, so my pieces, you know, just to, uh, to bring it together really relate rhythmically to this uh, uh, highly, uh, um, I guess, uh, uh, complex uh, rhythmic ideas of, you know, uh, um, you know, of, of, uh, uh, um, of Henry Cow mm. together with, with, uh, uh, um, yeah, together with Elliot Carter's harmonic mm. ideas. So I understand you actually brought on a couple of examples to highlight yeah, how you yeah. took the, uh, the original piece and then mm. transposed it into yours. Yeah. So perhaps you could walk us through one of sure, the examples. Sure, and, and I think it becomes much easier to, um, because 
actually, I, I, lately I've been actually listening to these examples, and I haven't heard them all against each other. Mm. Um, well, I have at some point of time, but I'm saying not, not 24 together. Um, it actually becomes quite obvious when you listen to hear the original and, the, and what I have done. Mm. Um, the other thing I should say is that the, the, the 24 uh, pieces are arranged so that you have slow, fast, slow, fast all through. Um, Anyway, this was, uh, yeah, the example, one of the first examples I was going to show you was um, John Anthill Corroboree, which some of you might be aware of. Um, now, this was composed in 1953. So I'll show you the, the Corroboree. Uh, I'll show you short, uh, uh, well, I'll show you, I mean, I'll, I'll play for you a short example of um, Corroboree, and then I'll play you a little excerpt of my piece. Mm. What you will notice, um, uh, what you will notice here is how my version really takes the rhythm of corroboree. And in my piece, corroboree becomes encuentro, you know, Spanish titles, and I think we'll talk about that yeah, later. But, yeah. um, but anyway, corroboree, so I take the rhythmic motive of the original corroboree and I translate this into these polyrhythmic ratios that I was talking about before. Mm. <laughs> so you get a polyrhythmic representation of his initial, um, when I talked about combining all these different rhythms and um, and also the, 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 I try and portray some of those intervals in the original melody um, in, uh, you know, the space between the notes in, in my version. So anyway, I'll play you the, the, a little bit of corroboree and then you'll hear mine and what you'll hear is not so much melodically but rhythmically a, a very a strong resemblance. Mm. And, and this is the, the, the first page of the score. And you can see here uh, the section that I've decided to, uh, well, it's actually the, the red uh, the bracket top, yeah. there, yeah, mm. the red bracket. Mm. I've taken that section um, as a, I guess, as, as a template or, or as a section that I want to incorporate in my piece. So this is, uh, this is corroboree. This is Encuentro. One last thing I'd like to say, I mean, you, you can see from the music there, 14, 15, it's very faint there. Um, but that actually means that he's actually playing at a different speed in the right hand and the left hand. Were all your compositions designed for piano? These 24 were, yes. Yeah. yeah. Now you've mentioned before that you actually wrote these with um, 
Australian pianist Michael Kiritani mm. in mind. Why, why did you have someone in mind in writing? Yeah, I, I think in this case it makes a huge difference. Uh, firstly, because I mean Michael is a formidable pianist. I mean, he's, um, he's considered probably, I would, by many people, one of the most exciting pianists plays in, in, in the country, really. Mm. Um, but also he's been a, a great supporter of Australian music and Australian composition. Um, he, he plays uh, uh, Alec Carter's Piano Sonata, which is, which is a very complex work. Um, so he's very familiar, I guess, with, with the repertoire. Mm. Um, I mean, he plays, uh, you know, the music of Messian and Ligeti and so on. So he's very familiar with a lot of these, uh, uh, I guess, you know, contemporary gestures, but also uh, from the technical aspect, mm. um, he's very uh, much... Uh, capable of, of, you know, interpreting this music. Do you think that, so, in picking, or in having a very skilled pianist in mind in writing these compositions, that it also challenged you to write complex pieces of music? Is that, is that um, what you're saying it helped you do? Yeah, but also when you, when you, it does in one sense, but also when you consider someone like Michael, he would, he would be very, very bored of virtuosity for the sake of it. Right. So, you know, he's, he's played the most difficult music. Actually, when Melbourne Symphony needs someone to play the impossible piano player, a piano piece or piano part, they'll get Michael, you know, he'll, he'll do it. Right. But really, when it comes to um, exciting him in a musical sense, I, I think it becomes a matter of, uh, uh, of having, uh, um, I guess the musicality becomes an important part as well. Mm -hmm. And something fresh. Uh, so you can imagine writing for him is actually uh, it's actually beautiful in one sense because you know really everything is possible mm. but at the same time you're restricted by the fact that you have to really think about um, while well, you know upsetting him in the sense of giving him something that he basically doesn't think it's very musical <laughs> um, therein lies the challenge <laughs> but look he's released uh, I think it's about 18 CDs of contemporary piano music just yep. piano music so he's very familiar with the repertoire and he's, for anyone that's seen him perform, um, knows that uh, um, it's an exciting experience to see him uh, uh, play. Mm. And, and look, he's a great piano player to, to write for. Mm. Too. Has he seen some of your co compositions? Um, a couple of these, ones? actually, a couple of these uh, that he performed last year um, at the Sydney Biennale. But no, no, no. no I, um, none of the others, so none of these actually. Right, so yeah. waiting, <laughs> yeah. waiting and ready. Um, so then how would you classify the, the kinds of music that you then compose? Um, <clears throat> it's a little bit hard um, <clears throat> to describe in my case, I guess, particularly because, uh, you know, composition for me has always been about context and not necessarily about uh, uh, following a particular, you know, I, I don't subscribe to any school uh, you know, be it a tonal or t uh, tonal or modal. Um, so I guess I'm very open, and, and it's to do with my background. I guess I, I was exposed to lots of music in my childhood, from popular music to blues to mm -hmm. classical music. I've had a great interest in non-Western music, mm -hmm. ethnomusicology. Um, so I guess from that point of view, um, uh, you know, when it comes to these pieces, I guess you could call them. You know, as a ge in general terms, you could call them contemporary uh, piano pieces mm. or new music, as as the term uh, that's generally used. Um, but in another sense, you could say that it's influenced by many things. Um, I, I know that sometimes the, the, the word eclectic is can all, almost be in a, a dirty word, but in my uh, I think in my case it makes sense. I mean, I, I, I'm eclectic as a person. I was born in Chile to a Chilean mother. Slovenian father. Um, I'm just as much, I feel just as much Chilean as I do Slovenian as I do Australian. So, yeah. in that sense, I think my music ref is reflected in, um, in, in the same way. So, there's classical elements, mm. jazz elements. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, you, and I think you, you had mm. an example um, that related to some of the title of highlights and um, things as well. Yeah, I guess, uh, um, yeah, there are a few. Um, yeah, I, I mean there are. I'll, I'll play you some other. I'll play another example actually. Where, um, yeah, this is actually Clive Douglas's uh, uh, Sturt, 
1952, uh, which in my case be becomes poema sinfonico, uh, symphonic poem. Um, now, you'll hear the melody in this case. I've, I have got a, a, a harmonic example, which I'll play you after this one. But you'll hear the melody here in the accents. Every third note is, is actually exactly the, the, the original melody. Um, this has a. This is where mathematics comes. I love, I love playing around with mathematics. It's quite quite a lot of fun. But the rhythmic sequence that I've used here is based on binary code. And you might think, you know, oh my God, why why binary code? You know, well, zero one 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 zero. You know, this kind of sequence. It's it's actually which is through, used throughout this piece. Is actually zeros and ones can be interpreted musically as as short and long durations. So it's quite quite um, quite a beautiful thing to. To play around with. So anyway, you hear the zeros and ones here, as well as the uh, um, you know the melody, uh, uh, um, you know the original melody in the accents. Mm. But I'll play you uh, the the stir first. So take note of the. It's actually the flute melody. Once the flute melody comes in, um, you'll hear that in my piece. Every third note, so not every every third note. Yes. My, my next example, uh, a bit later on, will be a, a little bit more obvious. But what I was going to say, as you, can, as you can see from this piece, not all the pieces are difficult. So the idea wasn't right to write every piece as a virtuosic piano piece. Mm. I must say, it's quite, I've, um, it's quite hard to sort of work out or remember from the previous piece, like the third notes, <laughs> and then to hear them, yeah. to hear them back. Have you ever overlaid the two together? Mm. But I think in my next example, when it is every note, becomes right. a little bit more obvious and, and, and easier to distinguish. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously you mentioned that, you, that all your pieces are um, Spanish translations mm. of, their, of their titles. Mm. I mean, other than probably the obvious cultural background, what, what was the idea behind doing this? Um, look, generally it's an aesthetic choice and um, I don't always have Spanish titles. Mm. In this case, it was just a decision I made. And, but I find titles very important. So, in, mm. in, in a sense, they they form part of the. I guess they, they're part of the inspiration for composition. So I find titles very important, and I found that the translations were quite beautiful in many ways. Um, you know, for example, the first piece, um, yeah, "Sleeping Child" uh, by Roy Agnew, becomes "Niño Durmiente," 
and you know to reinterpret in other words not to uh, I've talked about some of the technical aspects of my compositional approach but then when one thinks about even the, the, the you know even even the the, the intuitive uh, aspects of it mm. um, one can think of ways to replicate or, or to represent these some of these moods you know musically and they become I guess a second uh, a way to to try and reinterpret some of these pieces. Mm. So not just, you know, in other words, not just simply using quotations, but then thinking about, okay, um, what is, you know, what should be the mood of this piece, the sleeping child, and I try and represent that in the music as well. Mm. Um, but I think it was quite nice, and I mean, the, 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 the piece itself becomes uh, Luz Meridional, which is sudden light, and I think it's quite beautiful, really, in Spanish. Mm. So it's just the... Did you run into any problems, like in trying to translate them? Like yeah, I, I did have. Well, you know, for example, I, I think it was my next example here. Uh, yeah, concerto for trumpet and orchestra. It's quite silly to, <laughs> to try. Uh, um, you know, that's, that, that's to do with composers who, who don't uh, um, create a, a, a title as yes. such. You know, it's, uh, so concerto for trumpet and orchestra. Uh, uh, yeah, it's not not even uh, what's not an English word to start with, and. Right. Con Concertos becomes the same thing. So I, I, I looked at the program notes and I thought, okay, what, what else is, you know, what, what is there about this piece? And the whole piece talks about nostalgia and, 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 I, and I called it nostalgia. Right. Oh, that's so, yeah. so in some ways I did have to break away from that rule. Yeah. Um, I mean, they say that composition uh, is about creating rules, especially contemporary composition, mm. but also knowing when to break them because... Um, Indeed. Mm. <laughs> um, but I'll, look, I'll play this example because this is actually quite, uh, uh, this is more of a harmonic example. Um, and you hear the ex exact quotation of the melody here. This is a concerto for trumpet, Raymond Hansen, and Nostal here in, in my. Um, but this is where, um, this is another, getting back to math, maths here, or I guess uh, something related to maths again. But Colin Nankara was a, a, an American composer, quite an interesting composer, um, who, of all things, I mean, he went to fight in the Spanish Civil War. He was a, a, a de devoted communist. Um, now, Nankara moved to Mexico in 1940 uh, because of the McCarthy era and, and, and how people were being harassed and so on. Now, you know, there was the Alien Registration Act that uh, made communism a criminal offence. He went to live in Mexico. But anyway, he created this very complex rhythmic music. Um, and some people regard as, you know, the most complex, really. I mean, we're talking about contrapuntal systems using up to 12 different tempos or speeds, every, you know, elements that are tw 12, uh, playing at 12 different uh, speeds. Mm. Um, but most of his music was composed for piano rolls, uh, you know, in, in piano rolls, in other words, for uh, player pianos. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And we're talking about the days before MIDI, you know, I mean, MIDI <laughs> has been around for 20 years. In other words, you know, there was no computer, uh, 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 you know, th these, these uh, uh, rolls were created by hand, you know, yeah. they actually have to be cut out and so on. Um, and he's a really interesting composer because he experimented with lots of different... You know, I was talking about Canon's earlier 3223, well, he did ones based on pi, you know, so it's just <laughs> crazy stuff. Uh, but anyway, he had... The, and, and I love some of his ideas, and, and one of these is this rhythmic motive, which is 2, 3, 4, 3, 5, 6, 7, 6. When you think of these sequences, they might... Be, again, they might seem a bit silly, but when you think of 2, 3, 4, 3, if you add those as durations, um, they add up to 12. 3, 4, 5, 4 adds up to 16. 4, 5, 6, 5 to 20. Um, numbers divisible by 4 are quite nice to use in, you know, in, yeah. um, in a musical situation. Yeah. Um, so they can become, I guess, durations and so on, and that's what they do in this piece. So basically what happens is that I do use the, 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 the exact quotation of the melody from the original piece in this case, but it's converted to these nan carrot type durations, right. as well as a re-harmonisation. Mm. Um, so anyway, when you listen to it, you'll hear the original. Um, uh, but listen out for the melody, because in this case, it is exactly the same melody. Right. Well, the, 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 the first 10 bars or so of the melody, it's exactly the same, but re-harmonised and a different rhythmic, uh, um, I guess a different rhythm applied to it. Mm. 
And this is probably very obvious. I mean, maybe uh, as I, you know, as I uh, explore, you know, some of the some of the work that I've done with these pieces, maybe I'll find better examples. But at the moment, I was looking for some that were obvious, some were obvious and some less obvious, mm -hmm. and I thought that would be interesting. Um, anyway, so this is the original, and then you'll hear mine. That melody. You have to keep that trumpet melody in your mind. I've got one, one more example for you. Um, this is Alfred Hill, uh, Re Retrospect for Piano. Um, re retrospectivo in, my, in, in Spanish. Um, now this is a little bit less obvious, but what happens in this case is the original melody, I generate ostinato patterns, and what ostinato is just a, re a series of notes that are repeated. Uh, but in my case, I use the technique of isorhythms, and this is a medieval technique. Um, well, you know, it's, I guess it was utilised in 13th century polyphonic motets a lot. And what it is really, it's the idea of having a rhythm and, and, a, and a melody, putting that together, but one is actually longer than the other. So what happens, it takes a certain amount of cycles before they catch up to each mm. other. Um, but anyway, you'll hear, and this is probably an example where you hear a bit more virtuosity. Uh, so this is actually quite hard to play. Um, yeah, but this is the original. And what you get in my piece is actually one hand, well the left hand there quite steady and the right hand increasingly getting faster and faster throughout the piece, which is actually quite hard to perform. Um, anyone that's a piano player knows that it's actually hard enough to play both at the same time and to actually try and play faster with one hand. And we're not talking about, uh, see when you think of polyrhythms, uh, you have to I guess think of the, the idea of uh, primes. So in other words, it's very simple to play four in the time of two because it just become, uh, and that's not really a true polyrhythm. But when you look at uh, uh, ratios uh, beyond that, they become quite complex to to perform. Mm. 
Uh, I did one earlier, the 3, 2 and 2, 3, which is one of the simple ones, but you know, here for example we have 8, 9, 4, 5, 3, 4, 2, 3, 3, 5, 4, 7, quite, quite difficult. At the end. <laughs> is that is that that's, that's you playing? No, no. This is actually a computer you know, a, a, a performance. Oh right. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> wow. Um, obviously, again, yeah, that's something that probably Michael um, in mind would probably. Uh, yeah. Oh, look. Uh, find easy to play. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, there's a huge difference to be between a. a, a I guess a, a computer, uh, um, well, you know, a representation of the music and, and uh, a real performer. Because a real performer too, I guess, even though, uh, you know, in some, in some ways they might not replicate things, you know, exactly. In other words, they might not be as accurate mm. as a computer, but that human factor adds so much more to the music. Mm. Mm. So the coldness disappears and you... And, uh, yeah. So I guess, I mean, I suppose in sort of wrapping up, I'm mm. interested to know, other than the sort of compositions that you've produced as a result of the fellowship, what else did you learn from, from the experience of your time at the library? Um, lots, really. I mean, I guess it really gave me an opportunity to, first of all, I think it was probably, this was perhaps the first uh, time ever that I've had the opportunity to really research uh, a work thoroughly. You know, generally, we... we, we uh, you know, because of deadlines and so on, we, we, we're told, gee, you know, you, we need a piece by May or whatever, you just don't have the time to really um, spend time. I mean, I guess, uh, uh, yeah, three months of research is quite a, uh, quite uh, um, luxurious, really. Mm. Um, so from that point of view, it was really um, researching an idea uh, um, um, quite thoroughly, which is, which was really fantastic. I, and also, um, you know, in a, in a relaxed environment, because it's beautiful. I mean, if anyone has experienced that uh, uh, reading, you know, the dome reading room upstairs, it's quite beautiful, um, very peaceful and quite beautiful environment to work in. Mm. Um, so I, I guess from that point of view, um, it really gave me, a, um, I guess, an insight into um, approaching a composition from a different angle. In other words, really, really, uh, um, you know, I guess, through, uh, uh, I guess, as part of you know, doing thorough research before even writing a note, mm. it's something quite unusual uh, for many of us. Mm. And researching so, the composer mm. a little bit further. And, and I found uh, lots of things. I mean, you know, people like Don Banks. I just, well, you know, of course, these were composers that I I, I was familiar with in, in one sense, but not not as far as repertoire. You see, I, a lot of the time was spent actually listening and looking at scores. Um, and it's the most uh, uh, um, time I've ever spent listening to, to music. I was listening to music uh, by people like, you know, composers like Don Banks, Keith Humble. Um, Don Banks was, is, is an, an amazing composer. Um, now, he was, uh, um, in the 60s, he com uh, composed lots of pieces, I guess, in, in a jazz kind of, well, what you would call uh, the third stream at the time. In a, in a, it's, it's a jazz classical fusion kind of idiom. Mm -hmm. um, Keith Humble, who was another fantastic composer. 
um, who did I incorporate in my pieces. Um, now, James Pernberthy, you know, Peggy Glenville Hicks, I, I, I actually, I, I guess I, I, was, I got an opportunity to really get closer to a lot of these composers and, and really get a closer look at their work. Mm. Well, I suppose, and well, one final question, uh, probably an obvious one. What do you plan to do with the with the twenty four compositions? Yeah. Um, well, we've, we've already discussed with Michael, and Michael plans to record them. Um, oh, wonderful! So I think uh, I'm planning to finish them while well, you know by August of this year, mm. and uh, he'll record them hopefully later on in the year, and then and release them on CD. Um, and this will always, uh, you know, for sure, will form uh, part of some other activities. In other words, he, he'll you'll probably want to perform them live at the same time as recording them. Um, so, you know, lots of things to come, really. Mm. Um, and of course, you know, beyond Michael, there'll be other people that, it, you know, eventually will end up play, performing them and so on. But mm. at the moment, it's, uh, um, it's you know, it's, for, it's Michael's piece. So. Yeah, I'm sure that, and that'll be a wonderful moment, I'm sure, mm. to hear him play mm. um, these pieces. Yes. Well, I must say, it's been wonderful chatting to you, Andrian. Um, please thank Andrian for coming on thank soon. You. <laughs> And uh, this is a final little bit. Thank you for coming along. Um, oh, another thanks. book to add to your collection, Andrew, oh, about our so collections. Much. Thank you very um, much. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you all for coming. And um, we've got brought along a couple of samples um, from our collection for you to have a bit of a look at. So thank you and good evening. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew.